And again, off the page, I'm Leslie Choice. My guest today is Linda Johns. She's an artist, a sculptor, an author of three books about birds, an all-around bird person. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, now, you really are a person who's dedicated your life to birds and also learning from birds. When did that start for you? I think the birds themselves started it when I began to live in the woods, uh, in a house that I had built in the woods. And uh, when you're living that close to uh, nature, things happen. You know, nestlings, um, somehow you find nestlings that have gotten separated from the parents or a bird strikes your window. And if you're helping them, somebody else has the same problem. They bring their birds to you and it's still going on. So the birds found their way in. I think so, yes. Life. They yeah. seem to know what they're doing. <laughs> Tell me about your, your house. What, what's it like inside? It's kind of a flyway, really. It's rather built in an open plan. Uh, I have an indoor garden, and the indoor garden has got lovely arching plants and, and tall trees and things that the birds can hide under or be up in the trees, fly the back. The birds and forth. live with you. They oh, fly yes. around your oh, house. Yes. Cage is a four letter word. I have no cages. <laughs> <laughs> and as a bird gets uh, a little bit closer to being released, it's <coughs> taking much more tours around the house, and it flies through to the second store, which is all open. And uh, it depends on the height that the bird gets to flying and that gets closer to uh, release. So if I was to drive back with you to Anaganish today, Anaganish, Nova Scotia, and, and walk in the door of your house, uh, how would you be greeted by, uh, by your house guests? <laughs> well, there would be uh, calls from a blue jay and calls from an evening grosbeak at the moment, which doesn't sound like too many. Uh, sometimes we have five and six different species in the garden. At the moment, we're only down to two, so... Ooh. And the garden's in the house? Yes, oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have an outdoor garden to feed us, and that outdoor garden is shaped like a flying robin. It has a 90-foot wingspan, and it's a beautiful flying garden. Wow. And uh, you have a studio in your house? And yes. You, you create uh, yeah. art, including uh, sculpture from whale bones, among other things? Yes, I have a, a studio. I'm a full-time artist, actually, and writer. And uh, I'm a painter and a sculptor and things like that. And it, it keeps me truly busy. But the birds very much inspire what I do. Uh, they're, they're constantly inspiring the art. And, um, uh, and the art, I try to use what I learn from the birds and re you know, sort of translate it in metaphysical terms and try to pass that on. Can you give me an example of something that a bird can teach you? <laughs> they can teach me a lot about living in the moment. Um, we can um, we can benefit from this if we could do it. It's, uh, I think the Buddhists call this mindfulness. Mm -hmm. You know, to live truly and fully in the moment without um, constant preoccupation and anxieties about what's coming up, what's ahead, what's going on, or regrets, or you know, problems about what's gone past and what I should have done yesterday or what did I do yesterday. How do you know the birds aren't <laughs> having all those kind of worries as much as you are? Because they seem to enjoy each, each moment yeah. uh, freshly. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a moment uh, uh, like having a bath in their dish, um, they'll do that sort of thing, and you'll see them have that with intense enjoyment each day, every day. And they greet each day uh, their song and their emotions as though this is the day they've been waiting for. It has that freshness. I think that's what separates us in that sense from their activities. I know birds can anticipate. I've seen them anticipate mm -hmm. nesting seasons, and I've seen them you know, suffering from grief, from separations and loss. So I know they can also remember. Some people seem to think that they're kind of little mindless robots. Yes. But they, they're not that way at all. But they have that freshness and that pure enjoyment of each moment. If the sun comes through on the windowsill and they sit on that windowsill and have a sun bath, it's that incredible enjoyment as if that's the first time they've had one, each time. Yes. And we, we would, could do well to do that. You know. mm. I'm interested in, in all your house guests that you write about in your books there. Tell me about Chip. Well, Chip is a character. Chip is a, a grackle and a, a female grackle who was taken in when she was young by some people who had good intentions. Grackle's kind of a, a mid-sized blackbird. Yes, they're the kind of birds flex. that, uh, yeah, they have those uh, golden eyes. Mm -hmm. They come back in the spring and they have that iridescence. Oh, right, yeah. And they're quite devilish. <laughs> they have that sort of play, playfulness and they love to, mm. you know, busy themselves about things. When, when a wild bird has all the um, difficulties that would be part of its outdoor life taken care of, where to get the next bit of food and, and where are the predators and things like that. When that's eliminated, then that leaves a lot of energy for play. And it's wonderful to see wild birds play in all the things they'll do. How do they play? Oh, in many ways. Chip's a great uh, fiend that's sort of trying to do things like, she sets up little games. She starts little games and we start, you know, uh, taking part in the games that she initiates. And these go on, then she'll change the game to another kind of game. One game will be taking the little, uh, drain out of a sink, a little sort of a drop-in drain. She'll right. take it out of the thing. She'll drop it somewhere. 
and I'll pick it up, put it back in the sink. Two minutes later, it's somewhere else, you know, and this kind of thing will go on. Then she'll change it to something else, you know. And there'll be something else that we chase around. Or do you lose things in your house that you set down somewhere and oh, the yes. uh, bird picks up and flies <laughs> oh, off with yeah. it to someplace else? Oh, the Where? worst is vitamin pills. If you set a vitamin pill down and you turn around to get a glass of water and you come back and she's going off with it, you know? Right. So we have games. Wow, the games continue. Uh, two roosters as well yes. uh, were house companions. Oh, yes, terrific, terrific creatures. And they too would greet each day as though the sun rose expressly to hear them crow. I guess they did. They wake you up in the morning before oh, the sun comes yes, up? Yes, indeed, yes. But they're wonderful creatures. To have two full-grown roosters, as soon as you sit down, jump up into your lap and snuggle down and sort of lie, lie with their heads on your shoulder, you know, and then fall dead asleep and snore and things like that. I remember one rooster, and I was holding him like this and patting him. He had his head lying on my shoulder. And I was singing to him, and I stopped singing. And he sort of like, hmm, lifted his head, opened his eyes, and sort of pecked at my face. And I started singing again, you know. And, Ah, training you again. Closed his eyes and went back, and I would. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear. Well, um, this is what the rest of us are missing out on. Well, it's wonderful, you know. I mean, most people think of chickens as something like a rubber chicken joke, some sort of debased creature has no mentality, but I don't think so. Tell me about Basho. Basho is a marvelous quail, an incredible quail. It has lived, a, well, really almost twice the span of a quail living in the indoor garden. He's a wonderful ambassador. Uh, when wild birds come and are released into the indoor garden, Bashel's right over there to sort of introduce them to the uh, drinking dish and the feed dish and all the uh, sort of almost uh, unusual looking places that you'd find food, which is different for wild birds. They're not used to finding uh, water in a container like that, you know, and when it's still, it's invisible, so they don't always know it's there. Yeah. So he teaches them all of these kinds of things, and he's great with little kids, little kids who have mostly been exposed to plastic toys that wind up and make noises and run across the floor and are, you know, look at maybe sort of like birds or not at all, like a live bird. And he's very gentle and he can, uh, if the child is, is careful and under great supervision, Basha will sit in the child's hand and that makes a, a tremendous difference on a child. Sound like some great friends and teachers. Yes, yeah, he's a marvelous teacher. <laughs> of course, you're interested in the birds that are out in the wild, too. Take me uh, walking in the woods with you on maybe a late spring day. What do you see and what mm, do you hear? So much to see. Outside your house there. Yeah. Late spring, when you step out the door and you look around, first thing you feel in your face is the south wind that comes with that bears the robins back, you know? And if you look out in the field that's right there, you'll see patches of snow and patches of grass, and you'll see the robins running on the grass and pausing and running and pausing and just cocking their heads. And if you walk over the grass to see what on earth they could find, can there be any insects yet, you'll see that the, what looks like dead grass is alive with black spiders. And then if you cross the field and start going up through the woods on the old wood road, you'll find that the, that wood road being so protected is still covered with snow, but it's that kind of icy snow, like ball bearings, so you sort of slither your way up through the blue shadows, and you walk through in marvelous mixed woods, old trees of all kinds, shaggy trees that look like they need a good scratch, you know, and you come to what we call our sacred tree, which is a white ash about 300 years old. It, it takes about three adults spanning, so you can just join hands around it, and we always go to that tree to sort of honor it. It's just a, such a wonderful creature. You know? And the birds are there. Oh, and the birds tree are And all everywhere. the others of every stripe and every yes, color. Yes, I've yeah. called um, barred owls. Uh, done a couple of barred owl calls. I don't do too bad a barred owl. At least I don't think so. Come on, let's I'm hear a one. human. Uh, what's it, what's it sound like? <laughs> Can I do a barred owl right now? <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> They're they convinced. Yeah. They come down, you know, and it's really quite exciting to see. Now, you, you take in injured birds, mm -hmm. and you probably started doing this on your own, and I, mm -hmm. I bet people started bringing birds to you they after do. that. They yes. do, yeah. Sometimes you get back from a long day away, perhaps in Halifax, as we are today, and I'll get home and there'll be a message on the machine. I have, you know. It might be a morning dove, it might be an evening grosbeak. Actually, last fall we took in a gannet, which is really unusual, and the gannets are seabirds. Bird, yeah. Yes. They spend all their lives at sea, except when they come into the cliffs to nest. And they, um, they're marvelous. They dive from great heights and plunge through the water like arrows catching fish. As a matter of fact, one of our neighbors said he watched gannets fishing by moonlight, diving through in the moonlight, diving down and catching them. So we had a wonderful time with this gannet with his six-foot wingspan, stands about three feet tall, feeding him smelts, which was all we could get, actually. Mm. And the interesting thing was when you take a bird in that's um, whose life is spent on salt water, it's very important to give that 
bird salt water to drink. Not not yes. not fresh water with salt in it. That's right. But ocean water. <laughs> yeah, they're they're very diet specific. Yeah, it's yeah. So it's very um, important when you actually take in a bird, identify the bird right away, mm -hmm. and so that helps you to know what it needs. Whether it's a seed eater or an insect eater, it's no good to take in a robin and try to give it seeds. It won't work. You know? Or where its habitat is, that kind of thing. What is it used to? It's used to salt water. Ah, okay. Or, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah. there's usually somebody you can call, maybe at the Provincial Museum or something like that. Perhaps. would give you more information than what you would have. But what about, you know, those folks that say, here's a wild animal. It uh, has a broken wing or something. You're doing it more harm than good by taking it out of the wild and taking it home. It's going to traumatize the poor creature, that sort of thing. That, that would, would depend on your home. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I have been given birds that people have rescued and have kept for a week. And they have several children in the house that haven't been taught how to be quiet around birds and have rather played with the bird as if it was a Fisher Price toy, passing mm -hmm. it. You know, one child has it, the other one says, I haven't had a chance to hold it, I want it. You know, this kind of thing. That is indeed um, a cruel thing, really, to take a bird into that kind of environment. Because, especially a baby bird, you know, when you think of where they are, they're in nests, they're up in trees, they're in secret areas, they only see their parents. They need the same kind of environment that's sort of protected as our children do, really, when they're very young. And so you have to be careful what kind of environment. We're lucky we have set up a quiet environment and a semi-natural, really, with the indoor garden. We're doing what we can to sort of uh, put the birds in as close um, uh, an area of their own that they'd be familiar with as we can, you know. And I think that's the important thing. Um, taking a bird in just to sort of say that that's cruel would depend where what you're doing with it, how you're treating it, you know. But it is possible for the average person to actually find an injured bird and do yes. the bird some good if by trying to yes. rescue it. Very much so. And yeah. um, the learning from the bird what the bird needs and not caging it. For a wild bird to be caged is, is terribly detrimental. Mm -hmm. Very now, bad. you have um, colonies of mealworms in your closet. I have a feeling that, that it's not because you really like mealworms. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I can't resist. You know? <laughs> uh, yes, we have three tanks of them in the closet, you know, and uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing to have. That's a wonderful thing to have if you're taking in wild birds that are insect eaters. These creatures are very easy to take care of. They live in fresh bran, and you feed them chopped up apples. These are the mealworms now, mm -hmm. little, yes. little squiggly <laughs> bugs, yeah. cling on food. Yeah. yeah, and they create other bugs, you know, so they are, there is a beetle stage, and um, they, they're very good. So they don't need water, the, you know, they're very easy to keep in that sense, you know. And which of the birds uh, would eat these kind of bugs? Any insect eaters, mm. you know, any insect eaters, um, blue jays, robins, all those kinds of things. And a lot of the insect eaters in the spring like to have insects. Uh, sorry, the seed eaters in the spring also like to have insects because uh, that's when they actually get insects to feed their babies and then when the babies grow up then they switch. Quite a few of them like that. Right. You know, so. so you actually you have to learn about this diet and, and adapt yeah. to different kinds of... How many different uh, kinds of species of, of uh, birds might you have in your house at one time? could have six or eight, you know. It, it has gone as high as that, you know. And sometimes it's just a delight to look at the indoor gardens with every color of bird in it, you know. Some coming, some going, or some not releasable, whatever, you know. Mostly they're releasable. The big thing is to try to bring the bird back in health, give it privacy and give it, keep away from it so it's not interfered with by humans, and let it go as wild as it was when it came, but in good health, you know. That sounds in some ways very difficult because uh, what if they get adapted to the comforts of your home <laughs> and once they're reintroduced back to the wild, they're banging at your window to try and get back <laughs> we in. We haven't run into that yet. <laughs> no, they're generally no. happy to go back. Even nestlings, uh, you have to have pretty close contact with nestlings. When you're feeding a baby bird that's really young, say eight days old, you have to refeed her about every 20 minutes and then they gradually, thir every 30 minutes, gradually every 40 minutes. So there's pretty close contact. But there comes a point when you can teach that little bird to pick up its own food, then you start to back out of its life. And you present what I call the bug box, which is sort of like a nice clean dish pan, and uh, uh, some dirt in it, and a mixture of wild bugs and some mealworms. And then that little bird in the indoor garden will feed itself. And then, then you can back out of its life. And when it's ready to go, it'll be quite detached from you. Sounds like quite a time commitment along the way. You have to look at it from the bird's point of view, always. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with my guest, uh, Linda Johns, right after this.
Hello. Hi, welcome back again. Uh, we're with Linda Johns today. We're talking about her artwork and her sculpture and her books and her birds. Uh, Linda, do you feel a, I know you feel a personal connection to all these birds. Is there a mm. spiritual element to that? I feel there is, yes, because I have long uh, since let go of looking at the birds totally as individuals who are separate from myself. You know, it's become, they have become interwoven so much with my artwork that they, I use them in the artwork in more of a symbolic sense or metaphoric sense. And the, the, so a gaping nestling in my hands is something specific to be fed, which I take care of. But when I put a gaping nestling in a painting, it's as though we are at a new stage of consciousness and we are gaping for nourishment at that stage and are vulnerable. So they, they translate into uh, universal themes. The mm. particular translates into universal themes. Now, I know that when you do your visual art, when you do the sculpture, that uh, some of it is representative of birds. We have paintings of birds and sculpture of birds. Does it go further than that? Is there something that the creature itself is, is suggesting to you about the way that you actually work with that medium? Yes, very much so. For instance, when I used a, a, a rooster in a clay sculpture, I used that the rooster as uh, symbolizing the morning. You know, the rooster is sort of um, in the, used in a way where it's also a tree. So what I created was a tree of life. On one side, it's very much a rooster form, although still a tree form, and it has ri uh, rising sunrises all over it. But when you slowly turn that sculpture around, you'll see that the rooster disappears. The tree form still remains because the tree of life is the tree of life and death. And there will be an owl form, which is a little bit more symbolic of the night. And there will be waning moons, which is symbolic of death. Yeah. So when they all combine together, then you know, you'll see a sculpture like that, um, which has a s sort of a metaphoric symbolism. can be put down perhaps in any part of the world and have that symbolism. So it's not, it's not sort of held back by certain things which are only in our culture. And then those experiences came from living with those birds, from living with roosters who were very much guardians for me and guardians of the, of the night, you know, sort of protecting, announcing each day, and also the owls that I've taken care of, you know, which are uh, creatures that you feed on the other hand at night. And I noticed that one of your sculptors is an owl, and it's made from, um, it's, it's carved out of a whale bone. Yes. Is there any relationship between the bone from that whale and the owl itself? I find there is. I find because they're all, um, we're all in the same, we're all the same consciousness in a sense. You know, if you take it right down into quantum physics, you'll find that we're all composed of subatomic particles, so in tremendous uh, patterns of organic energy. And we are all there, you know. Uh, the whalebone is, is, is moving a little harder, you know, a little faster. It's, it's a harder substance, so it just means that the particles are moving a little faster. But it's really the same thing as an owl or our, ourselves or anything else. We're all so connected. And I find that it's a, a real honor to carve a whalebone in a way because it has been grown. It's an organic kind of thing. And it's really a, a wonderful thing to try to do something with it that is a sort of honorable to the, to the whale in that yeah, so way. Yes, you didn't go out and kill the whale. This is presumably a, no, a whale. I try to hold myself back from that. <laughs> <laughs> washed up on a beach somewhere. Yes, yeah, exactly. And, and retrieved. This yes, thing. yes. Yeah. All right. And whale bone in itself has such a uh, fascination anyway because it's been so hard to understand why we have pursued these creatures for hundreds of years, but at least in this century, we're coming to an understanding, hey, perhaps we uh, should hold back, you know, for various reasons. And uh, it's kind of nice to sort of, well, that brings in that element, too, that the owls are also endangered from what we're doing, and whales are endangered, and yes. this bone is also a bone of something which has gone past, you know. Yeah, we certainly haven't done a very good job of preserving whales. How are we doing in the big picture with birds? What's the, the state of Oh, the of numbers are down. Birds? The de numbers mm -hmm. are definitely down. And when you look around and you see st still things are sold to poison your lawns and the uh, nestlings are growing deformed beaks and you think, well, I mean, really, here we are trying to chase dandelions out. Dandelions are marvelous things. I mean, <laughs> really, it's crazy. I, I don't understand it. To me, it doesn't make any sense at all. And bird, I think a bird or a dandelion or anything of that na nature is so miraculous. I think it's so marvelous. Um, they've been around much longer than we have. I mean, birds alone have been around for about 150 million years. In, in um, Really, in contrast, we are just polywogs. Well, how can we change things? How can we do better than what we've been doing? I think doing we have to somehow world? delete our arrogance. We think we're at the top. Yeah, and there is no top. We're all in it together. We just look a little different from one another, but we're all in it together, and we're all 
you know, we're all driven by the same patterns of organic energy. We're all here together, and together we can make things work that way, you know. But when you can see what happens when, the, you know, the, someone starts throwing their weight around on this planet, as we have done, you, know, you can't do that. You can get away with it. You devoted an entire book um, to a robin, a single robin named County, yeah. called Sharing a Robin's Life. What, what did uh, County have to offer you? Quite a lot, yes. It's difficult even to sum up in a way, but raising um, her family, she and I were, were very unusually close because it's not very often that you see a, a human and a robin become spouses together, which is really interesting. I took her in as a nestling, thinking that this was just another one that would be taken care of and released at the right time. But when the time came, she had to develop quite a cough, and I knew she wouldn't make her migration, so I held her back till the following spring. But she, when I did give her a chance to go, she wouldn't go. She was getting very strong nesting instincts, and there were male robins back, and she'd be gathering nesting material all over the house, and I finally went and opened the door to her, and she came up to the door and looked out. But she just flew right back in the house, mm. and she started courting me. And this is really unusual, because I have read many books that, uh, on different birds and their behavior, and uh, they, I would be reading things like female robins never sing, and I'd look up at county singing, and I'd say, that's interesting. And I'd read about the fact that they have no courtship rituals, and I uh, shared courtship ritual with county every morning on my pillow, so I know about the courtship rituals. We built nests together, and we raised clutches of babies together. And I understood from that what the father's role was, because once the mother has finished with the babies in the nest, and although I produced the food for her, uh, the babies get out of the nest. She starts building the next nest for the next clutch, and the father is in charge of teaching those children. And I found myself in charge of teaching these. You were in a relationship. Yeah. Well, at that it was point. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Most unusual, really. And so she was quite an inspiration. So the closer I got to this kind of situation of relationships, the more, of course, it, it came out in the artwork. It was just a complete circling around and in and out, and one teaching the other. You know? And certainly in, in the book, it was very much a book of self-discovery, oh, again, led by yes. the bird, and I, you was the student of this teacher. Absolutely. I knew yeah. so little about being a robin, and lot, mm. much less about being a dad, let me tell you. <laughs> but now you know. And <laughs> yeah. if people read the book, they would as well. Uh, we're going to take one final short break and be back with Linda Johns right after this. <laughs> You've been watching Off the Page. My guest today has been Linda Johns. Linda, do people ever think you're a little eccentric or maybe even crazy? Well, I would say yes. <laughs> no one's ever accused me of being normal, put it that way. But uh, happily so. Happily so, very much so. Uh, and what about just a final last minute advice to people about how to tune into birds? What should they do? Listen to the birds. That's the important thing. When you find a bird that you think you want to help, the important thing is to find out what kind of bird it is for sure so you can give the right kind of food. Carry around a little book for identification. <laughs> that wouldn't hurt. Peterson's Guide. <laughs> That's right. And then give the, the, give the bird as much of its natural habitat in your home if you're going to help it temporarily as possible. That'll mean minimal contact with humans, perching possibilities, the proper foods, water to bathe. If you this is for finding those injured birds that yes. you're going to take into your home and That's help right. them out. And yep. then, you know, gradually let that bird heal without predators. It's important, too, if it let a bird wash. If they bathe, if they don't bathe, uh, their, their oil deteriorates, so it's important. Okay, yeah. got to watch out for that. Cleanliness next to godliness. Yes. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Leslie. And thanks for watching Off the Page. I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.